Hi, here comes video number three. Today is June 22nd, and this is chapter seven. So let's continue where we left off. We had just covered the topic of um, the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation, both to be used as measures of risk when, eva when evaluating standalone investments, okay? That's one company versus one or two or three other companies, okay? And I hope that that's all uh, clear to you. Please review that very carefully. And uh, let's move on to our next topic. Hold on, please. There are one or two things I'm going to skip here, folks. Okay, this is everything we did on the CV, the coefficient of variation. Okay, now, next we move to the portfolio. Now, we don't intend to hold one, two, or three stocks. We intend to hold a group of stocks. And by doing so, we achieve diversification. Typically, we want to add several stocks to our portfolio. That's what a group of holdings is called, if you weren't already aware of the term. That gives us diversification, and whenever you do that, it minimizes risk, and it makes your holdings generally safer overall. I go on to demonstrate that in the book, but I'm going to pick out a couple of highlights here. Anything that I do not put into this video or the next video I will not hold you responsible for. In fact, I'm going to ask you to omit certain things for the sake of expediency and prioritization. Okay? There are two ways to diversify, as I mentioned earlier in this, this course. You can diversify by company within a single industry. You can hold not one tech company or one auto or one biomed company. You can hold several. But if you hold them all within the same industry, you're not achieving the maximum effect, the maximum benefit of true diversification, okay? Yes, you're spreading your risk around by company, but an entire industry sector can go into a downturn. Um, for example, uh, let's assume, well, we saw what happened with the tech bubble, the dot-com bubble in the uh, early years of this century. Uh, all tech companies were dragged down, okay? Another example is, uh, let's assume that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, says that instead of five, six, however many years, it's now going to take seven to 12 years, I'm sorry, 10 to 12 years, uh, to, for a new pharmaceutical, a new drug to gain approval. That's going to send a lot of farm, big farm companies into a downturn, okay, the entire sector, regardless of how well that... Uh, that industry had been doing and how well the individual companies within that industry had been doing, everybody's going to be adversely affected, okay? So the best way to diversify is holding companies in different industries. Hold some pharmaceuticals, hold some biotech, but also hold some automotive, some oil, some precious metals, some consumer products, okay? That is the best way to construct a portfolio, okay? Now, uh, we move on in chapter, I'm sorry, in chapter 7, 158 and 159 pages, those two pages, 158 and 159, to talk about a classic curve on systematic versus unsystematic risk, okay? What does that mean? It means that you can take control of your portfolio's holdings and you can diversify away some elements of risk. Some of them you can't. Okay, so the ones you can control, you control by owning more companies in an industry or companies in several industries. That's more desirable. But everything ultimately can go into a downturn because of some major cataclysmic geopolitical event, a global event, consumer or investor confidence, as I say here. So uh, it is possible no matter how, uh, how well you diversify your portfolio, there is some lasting element of risk that you will not be able to combat through diversification. Why? Because it affects all stocks. Like the lowering tide is going to bring all the boats with us, whether it's your uh, $500 dinghy or a $500,000 yacht. They're all going to come down, regardless of quality. So please go to exhibit number 7.6 in my book, and here's what it looks like. I wish I could say I invented this curve. I did not. I stole it. I uh, adapted it for my own book. So here's how this works. There are two types of risks, some that you can diversify, some that you cannot. We call the, the risk that you cannot diversify systematic. In other words, it's typical of the entire system of stock investing. 
That's not a bad thing. It just means you have to know how to deal with it. Okay? So how does this uh, curve get interpreted? All right. On the x-axis, those are the number of companies, the number of individual stocks you own in your portfolio. On the y-axis, that's an element of risk. You can measure that in so many ways. I chose to name it as sigma, as you can see, the standard deviation. It can be anything, okay? But it is risk. So now, let's look at the red line, the line of total risk. Now, when you own one stock, one stock alone, you've tied your entire financial future, your entire risk. You've hitched your wagon to that one star uh, of that company's success. And we all know there are so many ways that company can be adversely affected. So, your risk is way the heck up here, ladies and gentlemen. So you say to yourself, self, I'm going to go get a second stock and add that to my portfolio. All right. When you do, your risk comes down substantially. That red line has just dropped steeply. Okay? And you say, whoa, this is great. My risk is getting less and my quality is staying high. So let's add a third one, a fourth one. Now, every stock you add, friends, look at that curve, the red line. It is starting to level out. Why is that? Because if you have a stock and find another stock that operates exactly opposite it, that's called absolute positive, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> absolute negative correlation. Okay? That means when one is bad, the other one is equally good, and vice versa. Now, you can't find more than two of those, can you? So every additional stock that you buy, no matter how unlike each other they look, will accomplish, accomplish by common sense less and less and less success in diversifying away risk for you. Okay? So that area below the red line but above the blue horizontal line is the area of risk that you can control and diversify away by adding to your holdings. Okay? All right, now you're going to notice that the red line after you add about 20 stocks, every additional stock you add is doing very little good for you. Another asymptotic line. It's never going to touch the blue line completely, no matter how far you go. You see the little break in the axis here. I went up to 1,000 stocks. Okay, there will always be some infinitely small element of risk you can diversify away but it's never going to touch that blue line. It's going to come so close it doesn't matter, okay? So once you've added about 20 stocks to your portfolio, every one you add after that is doing very little for you, okay? That's what economists call the line of diminishing returns. Would you agree? All right, now we're not talking about the y-axis here. We're talking about a blue line above the y-axis. That blue line represents the market portfolio, it's that element of risk that you cannot diversify away, okay? That's the tide that will raise or lower all the boats regardless of quality. So at some point we'll need a way to measure that and we'll conclude the chapter by my showing you one way to understand it, even if we can't control it. So again, the area of diversifiable risk is something that you can diminish the harmful effects of by adding more stocks to your portfolio, but after you've added so many of them, each additional one will do you less and less and less good. Okay? That's how that, that curve is interpreted. I hope you found that helpful. Okay? All right. Very good. Let's move on. And I'm not going to get into correlation with you. There is something called a coefficient of correlation. There is positive and negative correlation. It's very interesting. I'm not going to hold you responsible for it. I allude to it in this chapter. Uh, but um, if you would like to know more, I'll be happy to pass it on to you. So therefore, friends, you can ignore um, any reference at all to correlation, both positive and negative. It is, however, a very fascinating area. And I want to note to you that most stocks in the stock market have been proven to be positively correlated to a small degree. Why is that important? It means because diversifying risk away by buying more stocks up to a certain point does help you.
okay? Once you get past 20 or so, maybe 25, depending on which expert you're consulting, uh, the benefit becomes questionable, okay? All right, very good. Uh, I am not going to hold you responsible for pages 160 or 161 or 162. You will find them very, very interesting if you read them, okay? So they have to do with the measurement of um, standard deviation in a portfolio, okay? The uh, expected rate of return in a portfolio follows an average, and you can't uh, diminish your risk, but by holding more stocks, even if they have similar ERRs, you can diminish your signal, okay? You will not be responsible for that in this course, but please, I encourage you to read pages 160 through 162. I put a lot of research into that, and I think you're going to find it... Uh, a nice read, okay? Uh, I'm going to conclude the chapter by talking about beta. As you know, beta is the second letter of the Greek alphabet. That means there must be an alpha, right? Alpha precedes beta. And there is. Now, here's the deal. I'm not going to ask you to calculate alpha or beta, okay? But beta, uh, denoted as kind of a stylized capital B in the Greek alphabet, is a very important number. Now, let's go back to Yahoo Finance. Look up a company. We use Coca-Cola and McDonald's early in this chapter. And, uh, I'm sorry, really in this course, I should say. And um, when you looked at their data page, when you call them up on Yahoo Finance, way down on the right of the first two columns, you would have seen an item called beta. Okay, beta is an index that indicates risk, it indicates volatility. Now volatility, you know what volatility is, how much you react to something. If you're a volatile person and I say to you, gee, I don't like your necktie and you're volatile, you're going to say, oh yeah? Well, I don't like you either. Okay, you'll really react negatively, extremely to what I said. Now if I say, I don't like your necktie and you say, hmm, well, okay, that's fine, you're entitled to your opinion and you glide along. Well, now you're not a volatile person, okay? So now, stocks can be volatile as well, okay? So if a stock is volatile, that means if the market moves a little and your stock is volatile, it's going to move a lot. If your stock isn't and the market moves a little, then your stock will move hmm, just maybe even a tiny bit. Okay? So when the market moves, your stock will move. If it moves a little, it's not volatile. If it moves a lot, it is volatile. Now, I think you'll agree with me that the more volatile a stock is, the riskier it is. That means beta, ladies and gentlemen, which measures volatility, is a measure of a stock's risk. And it's one upon which many, many analysts hang their hat. Okay? So let's see how beta works. It's called the beta coefficient. It measures volatility and risk by comparing the change in the return of a stock to a change in the overall market. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to emphasize to you, it's not the stock's price, okay? It's not the volatility of the stock's price. It's the volatility of that stock's return versus what the market is returning, okay? So we're going to look at the market's return. We'll look at an individual stock's return and see how that stock's return reacts to a movement in the market, okay? Now, an index for beta is one, okay? So if a stock has a beta of one, that means if the market's return moves by a certain amount, that stock will move with it, okay? So a one index means that the stock and the market return are in lockstep, basically. If the market return goes up 5%, your stock goes up 5%. If the market's return comes down 2%, your stock's return comes down 2%. They are in sync, like watching synchronized swimmers. I always wondered when synchronized swimmers work together, if one drowns, whether all the others have to as well. But that's another story. Okay, so that's what beta means. It's similar to elasticity. You learned in um, economics that some products are elastic and some are inelastic. Let's compare a Three Musketeers bar to um, 
a gallon of gasoline, okay? Um, a Three Musketeers bar is very elastic. In other words, if um, Mars Company decides to really jack up the price of a Three Musketeers bar, then a lot of people will run away from buying them and demand will drop. It's elastic, it stretches, okay? So if they decide to double the price of a Three Musketeers bar, I'm going to go eat a Snickers or something, okay? I'll stop buying them. That's an elastic product. Now, an inelastic product is like a gallon of gasoline. I may complain and whine and moan about the price of gas if they jack the price up, but I need gas. I'm still going to have to pay that price no matter how much I kvetch about it. So that's an inelastic product. Demand won't drop quite as much as the Three Musketeers bar. Okay, that's what beta is like. Okay, so if a stock is very elastic and the market moves a little, the beta is high, that stock will react a lot. Okay? And the opposite holds true. If a stock has a low beta, the market moves up, that stock will follow, but only by a little. So beta is a type of magnifier, and it's a very popular measurement of volatility. Okay? Now, calculating the beta is not hard, but it is a pain in the derriere, so I'm not going to make you um, do it. I'm not, it's very tedious. Our time is better spent understanding beta rather than calculating it, and you can find out how to calculate beta in any number of finance textbooks. So, let's just go look up beta and interpret it rather than try to solve it, okay? Here's our general rule. If a beta is 1, then that stock's return moves exactly as the market changes. If beta is less than 1, that means your stock's return moves just like the market is, but not quite as much. Okay? And if your, B, uh, your beta is greater than 1, it indicates that the stock's return, again, moves in the same direction as the market return, but to a greater degree. Okay? Now, uh, companies that are more uh, aggressive, liberal, growth-oriented, they will tend to have betas greater than 1. This is a general rule, and there are so many exceptions, as you'll see. But uh, more conservative stocks, blue-chip stocks, established companies, conservative companies, their betas will tend to be less than 1. Okay? That's no surprise. The greater the beta, the more you would expect to make because the risk is higher, therefore your return should be higher. Okay, so a higher beta will indicate more risk, and you should be want to comp you should be want to be compensated rather for that additional risk that you are taking on. So let's say that your beta for a stock you look up is listed on Yahoo Finance as 1.1. Now let's say the market goes up by 10 percent, the market return, not the st price of your stock, but the uh, or the market price of the stock but the market's return, it goes up by 10%. That means your stock's return will go up, but by a little bit more. It'll go up by 11%. Take 10%, multiply it by 1.1, okay? Now, on the other hand, if this stock that has a 1.1 beta, volatile, is moving down, if the market return moves down by 10%, your stock will fall as well, but the stock's return, your stock's return will fall by 11%. So it will do what the market's doing, but by a slightly higher degree. Technology companies, more aggressive companies, biomed companies, new companies, will tend to have a beta greater than one, as I said before. More conservative companies, like utilities, that's as conservative as you, conservative as you get, will tend to have betas less than one. Okay? In a balanced portfolio, you should look for some betas greater than one and some less than one. All right, now let's go take one quick look at the book and show you how beta works. I'm going to skip this section on portfolios, but please, again, do read it. I think you'll find it interesting. Okay, this is a list of some betas of very popularly known equities. Pepsi, GE, Pfizer, Ford, McDonald's, Exxon, and Google. And um, I pulled these uh, sometime around 2013 when I wrote this book. And um, Pepsi is 0.26, no surprise there. It's way less than one. It's a very conservative company. GE, I would have thought, would be less than one. So I 
humble myself before you. I would have guessed wrong on that. They are greater than one. Pfizer, I would have thought would be greater than one, so that's a little surprise. Ford, well, automotive has been a little disrupted in recent years, so normally I would have expected that in the past to be less than one, but now the fact that it's greater than one, I can believe. McDonald's, dividend paying stock, cash rich stock, very conservative, no surprise there, very low beta. Exxon, similarly, strong company, one of the best, dividend paying. Google, yes, for a tech company, very established, very solid, beta greater than one, no surprise. Okay? And that's my timer. I'm going to have to end there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm hoping that I'll be able to end this with one more lecture. I might lapse over into two. Okay? So let's end there and have yourselves a great day.